Washington found the magic formula that no other empire had discovered before of how to make wealthy foreigners and wealthy governments and poor governments and the poor of the world finance the American government and the net imports of the American economy. Everywhere we look these days, we are seeing growing movements challenging the dominance of the US dollar and the financial hegemony that the United States has maintained over the world. I have focused a lot here on the growing campaign to de-dollarize in Asia, in Latin America, and the Greek former finance minister, Yanis Varoufakis, has given a very powerful speech challenging the hegemony of the US dollar, exposing the, is the scheme by which the United States has imposed the dollar on the world and extracted the value, the surplus value of workers around the world and enriched itself. And he did so in a speech that he gave this January. I wrote about this in an article over at geopoliticaleconomy.com. I have linked to it in the description below. And I will also be showing some clips from this speech that Yanis Varoufakis gave. For people who don't know, Yanis Varoufakis is an economist and he served as the finance minister of Greece and has since become a prominent activist and politician in Europe and criticizing the new Cold War, calling for a non-aligned movement. He's been outspoken internationally. But I think his, his most important contribution is his work as an economist. He is a trained economist with a PhD, and he brilliantly explains just how unfair and exploitative the global capitalist system is. And in this speech that he gave in January, Yanis Varoufakis discussed how the United States has created a system of neo-imperialism, as he describes it. And he says the highest form of neo-imperialism is financialized capitalist globalization. And it's based on the hegemony of the US dollar. Why did the original non-aligned movement fall prey to neo-imperialism's highest form, which is of course, globalization. Financialized capitalist globalization. And this system, he explains, has its origins in 1971 when U.S. President Richard Nixon ended the convertibility of the dollar into gold. And that meant that the U.S. dollar became this freely floating fiat currency. And he described it as basically an IOU, but it's an IOU issued by the hegemon. The dollar suddenly became something like an IOU issued by the hegemon. And that IOU issued by the United States allows the, the U.S. to maintain a massive trade deficit because other countries that are large exporting countries, they export their products to the United States. And he says this is a huge vacuum cleaner that sucks into the United States the net exports of countries like Germany, Japan and China. And that allows foreign capitalists to extract colossal surplus value from their workers and then stash it away in the United States rentier economy. It was a huge vacuum cleaner, the American trade de deficit that was sucking into America the net exports of Germany, Japan, China. But countries in the global south that are that are uh, that are deficit countries do not have a trade surplus. They have to import energy. They have to import medicine. They have to import technology parts. And in order to do that, they need to get access to dollars. So in order to get access to those dollars, those foreign countries, they sell bonds, which is government debt. And those bonds are bought up by capitalists and Wall Street, by vulture funds. Meanwhile, the deficit countries in the global south, in Asia, in Latin America, they constantly agonized over a shortage of dollars, which they had to borrow from Wall Street to import medicines, energy, and the raw materials necessary to produce their own exports for earning the dollars with which to repay Wall Street. And then when those countries in the global south can no longer pay those debts, the International Monetary Fund is called in the IMF, which then forces those governments in the global south to impose neoliberal austerity policies, structural adjustment programs, selling off their public assets, selling off their natural resources, cutting the minimum wage, cutting healthcare, and cutting education. 
The Global South deficit nations ran out of dollars and could not repay Wall Street. That is when the West sent in the bailiffs, the International Monetary Fund, that lent the dollars on condition that the debtor government handed over the country's land, water, ports, airports, electricity, telephone networks, even its schools and hospitals to the local and to the international oligarchs who grabbed this treasure, took rents, and what did they do with the rents? Sent them to American rentier capitalism to invest them. So in a moment here, I'm going to be showing a clip of this very powerful speech that Yanis Varoufakis gave. But I also just want to give a little credit here. I should point out that the economist Michael Hudson first exposed this scheme, this US dollar hegemony scheme, back in 1972, right after Richard Nixon ended the convertibility of the dollar into gold. And Michael Hudson exposed this in his book, Super Imperialism, The Economic Strategy of American Empire. And in 2021, Professor Hudson just published a new third edition of the book, updating it to talk about the new Cold War and the, the growing global campaign to challenge US dollar hegemony. So, of course, what Jonas Varoufakis is explaining here is something that Professor Michael Hudson has explained in many of the books and interviews that he's done. But with that said, this is the speech that Yanis Varoufakis gave. And in the description below, I will link to the full speech that he gave. Why did the original non-aligned movement fall prey to neo-imperialism's highest form, which is, of course, globalization, financialized capitalist globalization? The short answer is because capitalists in practice proved better internationalists than we were. Because they understood the nature of new imperialism better than we did. And that's why they won. What did they, they under, understand better than we did? They understood better than we did the new audacious imperialism that was born in 1971 when Bretton Woods collapsed and the United States dollar was no longer convertible to gold, prompting Richard Nixon to send a message to Europeans, European governments, and the world's capitalists saying, the dollar, as of today, is your problem. And how right Nixon was. As the American, the US, I shouldn't say American, as the US deficit skyrocketed, the world was flooded with American dollars. And the banks, the central banks outside the United States were forced to use these American dollars, since they could not be converted to gold anymore, as the reserves with which they backed their own currency. The dollar suddenly became something like an IOU issued by the hegemon. Before long, the global financial system was backed by IOUs issued by a hegemon who decided what foreigners holding those IOUs could do or couldn't do with the IOUs issued by the hegemon. America was now a fully fledged deficit country with a big trade deficit, but it was nothing like any other deficit country in the world. You see, Argentina, France, India, Greece, hmm? needed to borrow dollars. America didn't need to borrow dollars to back up its currency. It didn't need to raise interest rates in order to prevent an exodus of dollars. The exodus of dollars was the foundation of American hegemony. Capitalists in, central, uh, in surplus countries, countries like Japan, Germany, and later, of course, China, saw the American trade deficit as a great savior it was a huge vacuum cleaner, the American trade deficit, that was sucking into America the net exports of Germany, Japan, China. And what did the Japanese, German, and later Chinese capitalists do with all these dollars that they earned? They sent them back to the United States, they couldn't do anything else with them, to buy property in the United States, American government bonds. And the few companies, that the American government allowed them to buy, not Boeing, not Microsoft, none of the crucial ones. 
Meanwhile, the deficit countries in the global south, in Asia, in Latin America, they constantly agonized over a shortage of dollars, which they had to borrow from Wall Street to import medicines, energy, and the raw materials necessary to produce their own exports for earning the dollars with which to repay Wall Street. Inevitably, every now and then, as you all know, the Global South deficit nations ran out of dollars and could not repay Wall Street. That is when the West sent in the bailiffs, the International Monetary Fund, that lent the dollars on condition that the debtor government handed over the country's land, water, ports, airports, electricity, telephone networks, even its schools and hospitals to the local and to the international oligarchs who grabbed this treasure, took rents, and what did they do with the rents? Sent them to American rentier capitalism to invest them. Washington, comrades, had found the magic formula that no other empire had discovered before of how to make wealthy foreigners and wealthy governments and poor governments and the poor of the world finance the American government and the net imports of the American economy. A Chinese official once described to me globalization as something that was founded on a dark deal. That's how the Chinese official put it to me, a dark deal. Why did he call it dark? Because it was founded on a dark, unspoken, implicit pact between Americans ruling, America's ruling class and foreign capitalists and rentiers. Let me put it slightly differently. Suppose you could end American hegemony today. There is a button here, you can press it and end US hegemony. Who would stop you from pressing it? Okay, the US authorities, the military, the CIA, Wall Street, Silicon Valley, they would try to stop you from pressing this button, but they are not alone. A crowd of non-Americans would stop you from pressing it, including German industrialists, Saudi sheikhs, Greek oligarchs, European bankers, and yes, Chinese capitalists. In other words, the supremacy of the dollar has been just as functional to the interests of U.S. rentier capitalism as it was to German, Argentinian, Nigerian, Korean, and Chinese capitalists. Without the dollars and Americans global dominance, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, or German capitalists would not have been able continually to extract colossal surplus value from their workers and then stash it away in America's rentier economy. Meanwhile, Argentinian, Greek, Russian, Ukrainian, and Indian oligarchs would not be able to loot our countries, take their public assets, liquidate them, and turn them into property rights in the United States. That was a speech that Yanis Varfakis gave this January in Cuba at the International Conference for the Balance of the World. And this was a meeting that was organized to advocate for the new international economic order, which is a plan to create a, a fairer international financial and economic system that the Global South has been advocating for since the 1970s and that the West has consistently opposed. And I should point out that at this same conference, there was a very powerful speech given by a German lawmaker, member of parliament. Her name is Sevim Dagdalen. And in this, she condemned the NATO proxy war in Ukraine. And she said that, that members of the European Union have become servile vassals that are pursuing the interests of U.S. corporations and following for, foreign policy instructions from Washington in an attempt to preserve its absolute global predominance in the twilights of a unipolar age. She gave a very powerful speech. I wrote an article about that. I will link to that in the description below as well. Unfortunately, the audio of her speech isn't very good. Varoufakis's audio is much better. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna play the audio of her speech here just because it's hard to hear some of what she said. But anyway, um, I mean, Yanis Varoufakis is a brilliant economist and he deserves a lot of credit. For people who don't know, after the 2008 financial crash, 
the Greek economy was trapped in unpayable debt. In response to that debt, a series of right-wing neoliberal governments in Greece imposed austerity measures, cutting wages, and increasing taxes at the same time, and just tried sucking wealth out of the country to pay this foreign currency-denominated debt, and they were unable to pay it off. So the Greek people voted for the Socialist Party, Syriza, which was supposed to challenge that austerity and neoliberalism. Of course, they didn't do so in, in, a, in a complete completely shameful act. They completely betrayed their people after a referendum in 2015 in which the Greek people said they wanted to go against the European Union's neoliberal austerity. And at the time, Yanis Varoufakis was Greeks, Greece's finance minister, and he famously opposed the neoliberal austerity measures that were mandated by the so-called Troika, which was the European Commission, the European Central Bank, and the International Monetary Fund. And he wrote this famous blog post in which he said that the, poly the austerity program being imposed on Greece was a new Versailles Treaty, referring to the treaty, imp the agreement imposed on Germany after World War I that led to hyperinflation and led to the rise of the Nazis in World War II. And he said that the the terms being imposed on Greece were Greece's terms of surrender that was trying to make Greece a vassal of the Euro group. It had nothing to do with economics, nor with any concern for the type of reform agenda, agenda capable of lifting Greece out of its mire. It is purely and simply a manifestation of the politics of humiliation in action. And he pointed out that it was a complete annulment of national sovereignty. It was not the short of nothing short of the culmination of a coup. And in response to that, to his credit, he resigned in 2015 as finance minister, minister, and then completely shamefully, the Syriza government capitulated and gave in to these neoliberal policies after he left as finance minister. And since then, he has formed a left-wing political party and a movement in Europe and after giving that speech in Cuba in which he talked about U.S. neo-imperialism, Yanis, Yanis Varfakis actually went to Mexico and he met with Mexico's leftist president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, and posted a, a photo of them on Twitter. And in this tweet, he said, it was a wonderful meeting with Mexico's inspiring president. I thanked him for his steadfast support for our campaign to free Julian Assange. We also discussed how the new Cold War begets an urgent need for a new non-aligned movement and a new international economic order. So despite the fact that I do have some political disagreements with Varoufakis, he has been a very important voice on the international stage campaigning for the freedom of Julian Assange, the political prisoner, the journalist who founded WikiLeaks, who's rotting in a British maximum security prison for the so-called crime of exposing US war crimes and the U.S. is trying to throw him in prison. And he also has been a very important voice opposing the new Cold War. He, he calls it a new Cold War, which is very important. And in Europe, there are so many war hawks just calling for escalating the new Cold War on both Russia and China. So Yanis Varoufakis does serve, deserve credit for being uh, someone challenging the new Cold War. And I think the speech that he gave uh, outlining the system of U.S. dollar hegemony and neo-imperialism is very important. Professor Michael Hudson has been talking about this for decades, but we need more and more people, especially with big profiles like Yanis Varoufakis, to speak about this and to use the I word, imperialism. That is what the United States has maintained. It is a system of imperialism. And I'm glad to see someone with a massive platform like Yanis Varoufakis speaking about that. I would invite people to go check out his full speech I have a link to that in the description below. And I want to thank everyone for watching and listening to Geopolitical Economy Report. I'll see you all next time.